Okay, I'm going to start. Um, my name's Lou Tucker. I'm CTO of cloud computing at Cisco, Cisco Systems. And every time I pr and I've been involved with the OpenStack community sort of since the beginning, and one of the things is whenever I'm given an opportunity at these summits to uh, give a presentation or whatever, to me it's an opportunity to more or less think about something different. And in the last couple of days, right up to it, to hastily put together a bunch of slides which represent my latest sort of mulling around of different ideas. Um, and so this is not going to be a technical talk. This is really much more going to be a, a talk about riffing sort of on a theme that, that has been going on for a while, which is this notion of a world of many clouds. We've seen cloud computing exploding across you know, the IT industry and everything else. So one of the things I wanted to explore was as OpenStack gets more and more successful, what does the world look like when there's not just three or four public cloud providers running OpenStack, but there are hundreds, and hundreds and hundreds in different countries. And that what does that mean that when we have actually a world of OpenStack clouds? I'm glad to see Mark is here because also he was talking about cloud federation as well. So this is along the same kind of a topic of what happens when we have a lot of these clouds and is there anything we can learn from the internet? How we moved from a network, uh, how we moved from a whole set of different networks to an internet. Anything we can learn from that as we move from sort of the isolated islands of clouds that we have today to maybe something called the inner cloud. So, um, Juno is just out, tenth release. We should all be really, really proud. Um, many of you, I know, we you know started getting back together uh, in Austin or Cactus. Diablo was the first release I was involved in, and through each one of these releases, one of the great things about it is that the number of contributors has increased, the number of companies contributing has increased, and they've been getting better and better. By and large, that's been true. I know that in some of these releases, we did have problems, and we continue to have uh, a lot of issues that each new release, I think, improves. And so I wanted to, first of all, just applaud everybody uh, and, and hope that we are spending the time that we get together, because I think the reason why we've been able to go through this many releases in this short period of time is because we've got a very good structure for doing this. We've got a structure that every six months we get together in these design summits, and we really try to hash these things out because in face-to-face -face we can move a lot more quickly, and then on IRC and everything else we can go into a lot of the details. But so I urge those of you who are developers to really make sure you spend enough time in the design summits because we've got to, it's, it's FaceTime, and we need to be able to, to make progress there. So Cisco has been a major contributor to OpenStack since the beginning as well, and these are just a bunch of stats. And the great thing about Stackalytics, and I know everybody looks at it every day just like watching your stock price or something, but um, you can see how many contributors you have in your company and who's contributing uh, into the different projects. And uh, since we started this in Cisco, I've been watching that, and we've been growing our team, and we look at this a lot, and I really encourage people, we want to get up in the charts. The best way to also get up in the charts, and this is where we need the help, is in reviews. And so what I'm really proud of is that we've been able to move the number of reviewers we have up in our organization because that means that they're reviewing other people's <coughs> code. It's the best way to learn the code. And a lot of times people have asked me, well, how do you get OpenStack developers? Uh, you don't hire them, you build them. You grow them. And so you have to have people in your own organization or get, get great guys out of college and put them on reviewing other people's code. That way they learn OpenStack and they can provide a contribution very early in the process. And that's worked very well for us in Cisco. And we're working on a lot of things. Um, not a big surprise, we're working mostly in the Neutron area, in the networking area. Uh, and this is in a lot of uh, response to the change, I think, that's happening in networking. Uh, networking below OpenStack is in a huge, huge shift right now in SDN. Everybody's talking about overlays and o underlays. Before everybody came in, we were, we were talking about IPv6 and whether IPv6 can be used. We have a larger address space. Should we be using that larger address space to be doing a lot of the things around creating these, these logical networks based upon segmenting that address space, using that for 
route-based, you know, flow-based kind of, of isolation, so which might be a, a really important uh, concept for us going forward. At the same time, things such as cola I mean, and containers are important. So we've had participation there as well. As a company, we've been really in the business though of providing solutions, OpenStack solutions for our customers. And this has been working uh, with many of our partners being Canonical, SUSE, and Red Hat, bringing OpenStack solutions out into our customers, obviously on Cisco infrastructure. And that's where my team's been largely involved with that. And you've seen a lot, many of those customers up on stage uh, during these presentations talking about their OpenStack uh, implementations. What I'm most proud of is the fact that they are up on stage. They're joining the community. This is not a traditional vendor-customer relationship where we ship hardware with software and that's it. We want them involved in the community because that's what's going to be important to continue to move things forward. And this is talking about one of our latest announcements that we did with Red Hat around an integrated a UCS Red Hat OpenStack offering into the market. We also recently acquired MetaCloud. Uh, we're going to start to see a lot of this kind of consolidation we're seeing of, of these companies being acquired by others. And MetaCloud was particularly interesting to us because it represents another sort of point or uh, in this like go to market space. This is about being able to deliver a OpenStack as a service. So essentially the OpenStack is run on premise, remotely managed, than by Cisco. And so this makes it easier for people who don't want to have to learn how to do all the kind of management of OpenStack itself. We also recently announced InterCloud Fabric. This is, helps us in terms of the hybrid model, so that from an enterprise data center, you can extend your cloud offering either onto Amazon or onto Azure or onto OpenStack. And so it's a hybrid overlay model whereby from within an enterprise, you can start to move workloads onto other people's clouds. And there's also been a lot of news you've probably seen in the press. Everybody's now in a race of how many billion dollars you can invest in OpenStack. And this goes uh, not unlike the others in that, and that we announced though, and we are now moving into becoming a cloud provider. But the tack that we're taking is slightly different than others, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today, is really we're looking as doing this with our partners. In many ways, Cisco wants to always work with our partners, so we are providing now OpenStack technology at a number of different major service providers throughout the world. And therefore, we're bringing an OpenStack to what will turn out to be hundreds of data centers around the world, whereby in, whether they are in Europe or they're in Latin America or any place else, they will be able to have a Cisco essentially run cloud through their own sales channels. So they will be selling these services and the, on the back end they'll be run by Cisco running on OpenStack. And there's been a lot of press and I'm sure you can look at that. So in many ways, cloud computing is turning into all of these different ways of delivering cloud. We can deliver it in a public cloud, we can deliver it as a private cloud or an on-premise cloud. It's being delivered for IT applications. Uh, Comcast is using OpenStack, we've been working with them, to deliver video applications, Xfinity, their X1 application. So we're seeing it go into a variety of different, different areas here. I, you know, even in e-commerce that we're seeing, uh, Mercury Libra, IoT management. What I find interesting is that we're seeing a lot of management now moving to the cloud, even though you're managing things back inside of an IT organization. That's another area that I think is important. So, where do we see OpenStack going? I know on the foundation and the technical committee, we're having a lot of these discussions. Can we keep OpenStack as one thing while it covers a lot of these different use cases, these different markets? And I believe, that, believe we can. And, but it means that we have to focus on doing some things today and then keep our vision open for where this might go in, into the future. And that's what I wanted to sort of explore today, where it might go. So one of the things that's very important is that we recognize you have to win the enterprise. If we can't, even though we may be saying this is all about the new cloud applications, the cloud native applications, uh, IT shops really control most of the spend. And so we have to be able to bring a cloud into these IT shops, teach them how to move applications, not necessarily the way they were, but move what those applications were doing onto a cloud platform. And because cloud computing is absolutely winning and it's the only real growth area right now in IT. 
So within the foundation itself, we have started these different working groups. And this one is led by Intel. And what we're really focusing on here, we've got over 25 companies, Cisco's own IT guys went to participate in this. And then we're looking at things such as, what do we need in terms of availability? Uh, how do we do monitoring of this? How do we do you know, chargebacks? Um, the whole notion of cattle and pets, I'm sure that we keep hearing. I hate that analogy. I don't know why. I like cattle as well as I like pets. But, um, <laughs> and, then we've, and then we've also been kicking off these operators' summits because it's very important. These are people who are trying to use OpenStack. There's a lot of us who are developing OpenStack. It, OpenStack feels very different if you're a user of OpenStack. Uh, it's not so nice at times. <laughs> Uh, and so we really are trying to bring the operators together to get them closer to the whole community here. Uh, consequently, there's been a whole lot of blueprints, and this is the process that we want. This is the process, I think, that'll con that will help us move forward. You create a working group, you gather use cases, you, you expose the problems, the things that we need to do, and you submit blueprints so that other people can start working on those things. And this is how we work together as a community. So there's a lot of blueprints now that are going in, coming out of this application, this win the enterprise area. Another area uh, that we've seen is the NFV area. Uh, this was a little surprising, but in the last two years, we've seen l large segments of the whole telecom industry looking at the, essentially the money that they're spending on single purpose appliances in these core networking functions. And so we've got a lot of, actually, and a lot of businesses are based upon shipping these appliances and are now looking to shift that to shifting, to making these things deployable as virtual machines on top of OpenStack. So this is a completely sort of, a, and one view, you can say this is the orthogonal view of what you want OpenStack to be, but I see this as fitting in very nicely because we want to see these kinds of things merged into one platform. To do this, so not surprisingly, what they're talking about, they need to be able to dynamically provision resources. Well, check, OpenStack does that. We need to be able to do networking, and we need to be able to do provisioning. Now we have to extend provisioning, though, outside of just the data center, do provisioning also in the WAN as well. Uh, we need to be able to have real-time response. So latency becomes really important. Measuring things becomes really important. We need high availability. And as a matter of fact, this is, I find this funny one because we, we talk about this in sort of carrier grade OpenStack. Well, who wouldn't want carrier grade OpenStack? I know if every enterprise would also like it to be just as reliable and available as anything else. So this is right in line with what we're trying to do as well. So I think that this is bringing up a lot of these areas that, again, we are forming uh, several blueprints around and that there have been talks and panels, I know in the show here, talking about NFE. But don't look at it just from the point of view of those of the networking guys who are worrying about how they're going to go and, and, and build a NAT server or a DNS or anything else. Think of these other things as well, which are going to influence and hopefully improve what we're doing in OpenStack. Um, I also think we're going to see a couple generations of these network services. The, the simple ones now, by and large, are simply making a virtual machine form factor for a particular networking function running on an x86 box. And everybody likes that, says, oh, that'll drive down the cost of it and everything else. That's not going to be sufficient. The second generation, these are going to have to become distributed systems. And I think that's where it's going to be interesting. So those of you particularly coming out of a background in distributed systems, this is going to be an interesting place to watch. Because if you're going to have to support, you know, millions of NAT endpoints or whatever, you're going to need a cluster of these things. They're going to have to be able to share some state, and they're going to have to be able to horizontally um, scale. And that's not the way these boxes were designed originally. But they have networking protocols that allow you to do that. So it's, I think it'll be a very fertile area of innovation in the next couple of years. Another one, reaching back actually a couple of years, in this notion that, well, we've got all of these devices coming online. So that we've been looking at it mostly from the infrastructure core, focusing OpenStack and how do we get this to work inside of a data center. But we know that we're now connecting mobile devices, handheld devices, everything else, and we know that there's even a larger swarm of these devices going out into the rest of the world. Uh, it's interesting, we've got some people here from Cisco who've been working on looking at putting OpenStack managing all of these different kinds of devices. And, and, and that, I think, is an, another interesting play. Ultimately, you know, we're also going to see it in these cars. 
And again, these are all network-based systems. There's so many devices now on a car with the networks, and as these things get smarter and smarter, where they're going to be, they you know, park themselves, they're eventually going to be driving me to work, and everything else. This I want to be able to manage from someplace else like a cloud. So in many areas, I think what we're seeing is that more and more of these management systems are moving into the cloud. Many of you may know that we acquired a company, Meraki, which is management of Wi-Fi access points. And that's now being done from a cloud, and people love that. I mean, it's kind of, it was a puzzle to me at first why it would, would appear that way, but it becomes an easier place to manage things that are spread out all over when you put them up into a cloud. Um, you know, actually, Apple made that shift a couple years ago. I was surprised when they said that they no longer thought that the laptop or the PC was the center of the universe. <laughs> it's now iCloud, because that's the only place that you can connect and synchronize all these different devices. A new one, which I think is really interesting, and this actually doesn't have anything to do with OpenStack, except for the fact that Jesse Andrews is there and Troy Toman, some of the original people inside of OpenStack, are now working at a company called Planet Labs. Planet Labs is sending up a fleet of these little so tiny satellites, and essentially they're making a line scanner going around there in geosynchronous orbit. So as the Earth turns, they're scanning it, and in 24 hours they've got a complete picture of the Earth. As one, you know, and now what do they have to do? Well, of course, these are discrete pictures. They have to be stitched together, and that they can do things such as looking at water utilization, at population growth, at ground cover, at, at forestry areas, and then sell that information. And I just happen to like the idea that it seems that now some of the early people inside of OpenStack are now working on this, even though they're running this on Amazon. But it's an I, it, but so I, I like clouds. <laughs> I like cloud computing and that we are seeing that this is another example of we've got an enormous amount of data that we want to be sharing. And they, their idea is to democratize access to this picture of the Earth for everybody on the planet. And I hope they are able to fulfill that as well because half of that they want to make <coughs> in the public domain. So it's another area which I've really been interested in, which is this notion of not just open systems but open data. The more and more data we make freely available like this, I think, will mean there will be more and more companies started up finding useful ways uh, to package and sell and use that information. So, coming back to OpenStack, really, what is our future here? I mean, are we going to, we're clearly on a trajectory to win in this marketplace. And that we're seeing almost all the major IT vendors are now uh, involved. And so what happens when we have lots and lots and lots of these OpenStack clouds out there? And should we start thinking about that so we can shape the blueprints and everything else we're going to for this kind of cloud-to-cloud -cloud interoperability? So let's turn back the clock and look back at how this happened for the Internet. Um, not sure how many in the audience remember the Internet when it was this size. Uh, I actually do. It was in 1977, okay, a few of us or whatever. And you could count the number of nodes or imps that were on this and where they were, and you knew who the system ad admins were for these devices. And we could send mail. It was wonderful. And we could share files. Uh, it was wonderful. And, but we had no idea, you know, that that was going to become this. Uh, fortunately, a, a couple of major, you know, of sort of, Critical decisions were made early on that allowed that kind of growth. And it wasn't completely a straight line as anybody who's been involved in has known, but we were able to get to this kind of scale so that now the rest of the world looks at this and says, that's the Internet. You know, it wasn't always that way. Before, there used to be all these different networks <laughs> and that you would have to be in one network and you moving from one network to another network. There were different protocols involved and everything else like that. And what we came up with instead through, you know, IP-based systems, TCP IP standards, IETF work, a lot of the work that's done by several people here in the audience to come up with these different protocols so that now even, you know, my 20-year-old daughter knows what HTTP is. You know, <laughs> that's surprising. At least she knows that's the thing you got to put in the front of something if you're going to if you're going to, you know, get to Facebook or something. Um, so, and the other attribute about this, this wasn't done by one company. Here are the different companies. This is like, there's these autonomous systems that are connected. So this is fierce competitors 
exchanging packets, allowing other traffic flow to go through those networks so that you can create that internet. Uh, and this is largely using protocol around BGP, which means that you are a way to exchange information so you can have essentially a mail system of routing packets throughout the internet so they go where they're supposed to go. And this means that you've got AT&T working with Level 3, working with Verizon, with Google, China Telecom, Cisco, and your companies as well through these, through these different kinds of, of distributed computing protocols that allow this to interoperate and send packets around to the world. And therefore, we've got, you know, huge, huge networks of these things. And this is, you know, um, very interesting graphs that can always be made and visualizations around it. But also, mistakes can happen. And um, those of you who get CSCM, um, a recent issue or whatever, was talking about <coughs> some of these mistakes and why it's taken so long to get to secure internet routing. And there's been some very interesting, you know, things. At one point, two-thirds of the internet YouTube traffic you know, went through Pakistan, and Pakistan was blocking it, so it went into a black hole. No YouTube. Uh, another point, I think there were 18 minutes that China Telecom hij essentially hijacked all of the traffic from Verizon. Both of these were believed to be human error mistakes that were made. Somebody put a wrong entry in terms of how much of the prefix that somebody should be looking at, and all of a sudden the rest of the, the, the world's traffic ends up going into different places. So it's not without problems, but we've come a long way, and it's still very much a, a work in progress, but meanwhile we're able to use the Internet. So this gives me some hope even with OpenStack, because I, I hear problems about OpenStack every day, because we're deploying it and everything else, and I keep thinking, that's okay, <laughs> it's okay. It's going to get better, and we will always have problems, but we have to just keep moving forward. And because, and look at how the Internet's working today, and even though we have these issues from time to time, and it's a great article if you ever want to take a look at it. So in clouds, what do we have? Well, today we have three major big elephants in cloud computing. We've got Google, Amazon, and Azure. And you can see them in these kind of maps. So the question is, as we build up more and more OpenStack, and we've got these other clouds, is there a way for us to start thinking about this as becoming a cloud of clouds? Following that internet model, these are different companies that is, can be working together, and what would it mean to have a cloud of clouds? Back at the early internet, I, I don't think anybody, I mean, Fred, do you remember anybody even thinking what would you use ARPANET for? I mean, it wasn't, wasn't really conceived of it being, oh, a place that I'm going to be d having Facebook friends and Twitter feeds and, and everything else. Maybe Twitter actually was closer, because I remember we did have talk and some other things that worked across it. Um, so OpenStack on a global scale. And there's a, there's a couple good reasons why we want to do this. Uh, first of all, it would be nice to have it every place so that everywhere you went, you can have an OpenStack cloud. Y if we can work through all the processes that we're trying to do with DevCore and around the, the, the developing of what does it mean to be OpenStack, you can have applications <coughs> that can a broader reach for application developers in terms of this. And they can serve local markets. Because one of the things that is, is, is we are still fiercely local people. We are in France, have you noticed? <laughs> uh, it's different. Uh, they speak a different language, they have different privacy laws. Uh, they have different notions around what kind of information they want to keep private. So as we build these global clouds, we have to respect those local conditions. And so we want to sort of think globally and act locally. Um, we also want it to be multi-vendor. One of the things I hear all the time as I'm talking to customers about OpenStack is that they don't want vendor lock-in. As a vendor, it might make me feel bad or something, but I, I respect that because I don't want a customer locked in for some arbitrary reason. I want the customer getting a product from me because it's the best product. I want to compete on the implementation. And so that that whole notion can have, a, have an advantage here. They should be going to the best cloud or the cloud that meets their requirements. I would expect to see clouds that are OpenStack clouds catering to different markets, catering to a high-performance computing market, catering to a biology or pharma market where they have special, um, they've got special you know, ability, abilities to comply with different HIPAA rules around their data. All of those kinds of things around OpenStack we can have lots of room for competition.
But having a common model means that you can have a larger market in which to, to play on the developer side. So we have to, so it aligns very strongly, I think, with the, with the essential notion of open stack. But then we also have to sort of balance that because we want to have heterogeneity, but we want to have heterogeneity is good because you have much more resilience if you're not all built on the same platform. But you want to have the common platform so that you can have the largest application base targeting them. So what will it take? First of all, it's a lot of business agreements. And so Cisco is engaged in this right now with InterCloud, and it's a lot of business negotiations. Um, and believe me, the way the telephone systems work and, and any of the internet work, there is a lot of business relationships around peering behind it, making it so that they can, they can carry each other's traffic. With cloud computing, now it's not just networking, but it's also compute, it's storage, it's customers, identity management, and things like that that we need to be shared. Um, we're going to need probably some intercloud protocols for that. That's how, si that's how distributed systems work. They have to be able to exchange information, talk to each other in a common language to do these things between these clouds. And I don't know what those protocols are. And so I want us to start sort of thinking about them so that we can start designing them into the systems. That would allow services marketplaces and exchanges to be built so that you could have companies that, that develop applications, put them into a app exchange or something out there, and then consumed by any of these different clouds. And we need then there are things such as federation, you know, and policy also becomes really important here as well, because right now a lot of the, the way we enforce policy is through networking. And through ACLs and things like that are very, very specific to either a vendor solution or a particular data center. So one of the things that the central question on this is that can we do this you know, can we have this kind of inner cloud based on this kind of community-driven model instead of waiting for one of those large service providers to come out with this global cloud? And I would want to put my bets on the community as being able to do this and, and embrace them and bring them into that community as well. So with Cisco, that's what we are, we're beginning to do with inner cloud. We're working with, first of all, and foremost, looking at uh, the different applications, particularly that Cisco already has in SaaS applications around WebEx, ScanSafe, and a lot of other applications, putting them on this cloud, working with our partners, and working with even linkages into the public clouds so that you can start to have, this is a very, very early prototype, let's say, of what we're thinking about it. And I've had it described as an alliance between Cisco and partners so that we can make this happen. So some of the work that we've been doing directly in OpenStack around this has been, first of all, in terms of federated identity. Uh, that becomes a keystone. You have to be able to start there. You have to be able to have keystone SAML assertions and everything else so that you can have users logging into different clouds. Single sign-on is just so old school. You have to have that at this point. And then can we start to move up the network again? Because when we get around to policy, you much want to capture developer intent. This application should only be accessible from either these points in the world, you know, I don't want this accessible from this other geography, I want it only accessed by these people, I want it only using these networks, and that can only be done by having a sort of a meta language, and so there's a lot of work like in Congress and, and other things trying <laughs> to define policy. In OpenStack, we've got in-group policy, APIs that are being discussed and the implementation of that, that should be able to work on this as well. And so there's some other links here. First and foremost, we've got to get OpenStack adopted. And therefore, we have to get these issues around stability. We have to be able to become trusted, uh, and trusted both in terms of availability, but also in terms of, of security. I really don't want to see vulnerabilities you know, exposed on OpenStack. That would kill this notion very, very quickly. So it's important that we do that. And then I think we have to start think about networking in the broader sense. Stop looking at it as a data center problem. It really has to be a multi-data center issue. We have to look at the WAN, and we have to look at the emerging technologies in networking today to make this effective. So, in summary, sort of like, you know, could the internet have been built by one company? You know, I really don't think so. It's not likely one company could have done it. There were many that were trying to. And it was only when we really developed the technologies that allowed multiple companies to cooperate that we got to the growth of the internet. And so will OpenStack be the community that builds this intercloud? Or will it be a single company? 
or some of the other large providers today. And I think that's really up to us. And so that's why I wanted to sort of bring up this topic now so that we can start to think about that as we go forward and designing the next set of features uh, for OpenStack as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, I will take any questions we might have. I think I've got a 10 minutes. Wonderful. Great. Or any other debates we want to have? We'll start with questions about this topic. Anybody else been thinking about inner cloud or a cloud of clouds or federation? Yes. Yeah, maybe, maybe come, I think that's an important question. Could you repeat it then for, or oh, let me rephrase it. I think the question was, how do I see the impact of politics on uh, any, this notion of inner cloud? Um, obviously, it's going to have a great influence. <laughs> and I think that we're seeing the struggles even now on the internet, particularly around, I know Google's having problems in certain countries. Uh, so politics is going to always have a play here. And I think I don't have an easy answer for that. I don't think we're going to change the world and becoming everybody is going to be the same. So we have to accommodate local differences. And so simple case around data sovereignty. You know, yes, guess what? If you're in Europe, you're probably going to want your data not to leave Europe. So you might want, you might be want computation or an, the execution to go someplace else, but your, your promise to your customers is that their data is going to stay in country. And it's very, and if we build that in early on, I think we have a chance of, of being able to enforce that kind of policy. Politics is, I, I think, going to be very important. Yeah. So uh, you gave analogy, interesting analogy of internet and intercloud. Obvious so one. obvious one. So in case of internet, you had a governing body like IETF, which had a substantial role in determining uh, the success of internet. Uh, so two part questions. Uh, what kind of governing body do you imagine for an intercloud? Because you would need something like that. Otherwise, things won't automatically happen. And then the second part question is, you have companies like AWS, Google, Azure, you mentioned, which have to play a very integral role in participating in these kind of governing bodies. So how do you view uh, this kind of body be able to corral these kind of companies so that everybody goes and works on a common vision of intercloud? Uh, that's a great question. I may want to have Fred comment on it as well because he's been a part of IETF. One of the, uh, the only minor comment I make about it is that it's actually, um, it was less around governance, it was around actually request for comments. So maybe Fred, can you give us any of the response to that? Because Fred Baker's been involved. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I was the chair of the IETF for five years and been involved in this just a bit. Um, um, <clears throat> I don't know, you want to pay me to do that? Um, <laughs> it wasn't about governance. It wasn't like anyone sat down and said, thou shalt do it this way. Or, or, well, actually, there was somebody that sat down and said, thou shalt do it. It was the operators of various and sundry networkers said, you know, I've got IPX, I've got Apple Talk, I've got, no, IP, do IP. Uh, and basically pushed all their vendors in that direction. As far as governance, we had two structures. One of them was the Internet Assigned Number Authority, which you've probably been hearing about in the press for the last year, trying to figure out who hands out IP addresses, who handle, hands out top-level domains, and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, so, so working through those issues, and they set up what's now called the NRO, the, the Regional Internet Registries that hand out addresses. They very much took a service perspective. My members are companies. I give them resources in terms of address space, and they make the business work. And the companies do whatever it is that they do. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm enabling them to do it. With the IETF, we were developing protocols and, once again, enabling communications. Okay? Not for some purpose or, you know, thou shalt do it in my way, but enabling people to innovate and to move ahead. And uh, then what happened after that 
was that all the different companies came in and said, okay, I'm going to build on this base. I'm going to innovate in my way. This needs to come back to the community. This I can, I can take as my own, and we're able to move ahead. Uh, and the internet as we see it today came out of that process. A whole lot of elbows and a whole lot of working together. What I'd really like to see in OpenStack is exactly the same. That's great. And I think we have part of those processes in place today. I mean, that's why we've got blueprints, be very, which is a proposal that we use it to rally people who want to work on that. I think what's different is that we're approaching this, and maybe, and this is sort of the shift, I think, in the sort of standards, bodies, work versus open source. We're building the software, and I think that what we're trying, what we have to make, what we have to recognize for to get interoperability, you have to understand you still need the standards, and you still need the interoperability, and still need the APIs. There has never been a problem between open source and standards. Okay, open source is a way to develop things. Standards is about what to develop. And if we can work together, it actually works pretty well. Great, thanks, man. Five minutes left. Yes. So for identity federation, you mentioned you can't really do this without it. Um, you know, there's there's various and sundry identity stores and multiple providers networks, and, and you're talking about Keystone and what it means to OpenStack. Can you sort of elaborate a bit there and how they might uh, hook together? Simple answer, no. <laughs> um, but it's a problem that we need to address. Uh, and I don't think it, it stops just with the use of SAML or any assertions around who I am that you, you have to say, okay, well, which authority, like you'd mentioned, so we have to be able to support many of them. We just want Keystone as a framework to be plugged into that, just like we're plugged into Active Directory or anything else. We should be able to do that minimal. Um, I also worked at Salesforce for a while and did App Exchange there, and one of the things that you need to also recognize is that you often need delegation and to operate uh, as if you are somebody else, because if you're providing a third-party service, that is providing services into, let's say, a VM that's owned by a particular person, you have to be able to have privileges on that. So we really need a much fuller RBAC kind of approach in Keystone where you can have chains of delegated permissions on this and keep it simple at the same time. <laughs> so I think there's a, so that's why I was pointing out that work that's being done because I would urge people to really spend the time to, let's try to make Keystone work. I think that that's one of the issues that we're having if, if it's not if it's not solving problems, the right problems for different service providers, then they're going to do their own. And I think having a common identity system is really important, particularly <laughs> if you want to get up to this level as well. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, what are the key points to handle intercloud traffic? So. Uh, what point is discussed in working group? Uh, I think there are many types of uh, data flow in uh, cl uh, current uh, current services. So, what do you think? Keep on? So, if the if the question is what kind of of do we need a common mechanism to pass traffic? I think we already have that, and that's why we've got TCP/IP. Fortunately, the or are you able to talk to another service on the internet? Uh, we have that today. So we can build on that framework. And so you know, b b be REST is a very common way for you to be able to use somebody else's service without knowing anything about how it's implemented inside. Maybe your question though is getting more to the fact that when we start talking about very big flows, if you're moving, we know that, it, that I love the analogy of saying that, that the highest bandwidth network we know today is FedEx delivery, you know, because they're shipping disks. Uh, and the network is lagging behind, the, and the growth of data is happening faster than the, the availability of bandwidth. And that's creating all sorts of problems around data gravity. Data, once it's created in a place, tends to stay in a place. Data at rest tends to stay at rest because it's too hard to move. Um, if we have a better notion of an integrated cloud of clouds, I think we can start to exploit more and more linkages between that and increase that and solve some of these problems. Um, but uh, to me, that, that's totally 
a new area for are there alternative means of, of transporting large amounts of data. And then you've got on the other side, well, what about really, really tiny amounts of data? It seems like in, in networking, we seem to oscillate between trying to solve one problem or the, or the other, and we need much more kind of unified approach. Probably one more question. Yeah. What would you say should be the base set of capabilities for an intercloud? If we were to design a system today, where would we start in terms of what does it need to do? <laughs> That's really a hard problem, <laughs> uh, hard question. So what are the base capabilities? I think it starts with how do you allow use Again, that's why I sort of said identity, federated identity, being able to have a customer go from one, be enabled provision. If you've got a relationship between two different cloud providers and they say, okay, a customer of cloud A should be able to use services on cloud B with the same identity. That would be the, that's table stakes. You gotta be able to do that. Um, the second is that you have to be able to do service advertisement, I think. What are the, are you running the same set of OpenStack services there as I am running here so that you can create profiles of your applications to know whether your application is going to, to be able to be run there? Um, some of that is, is intersects with the dev core, stuff that we're trying to do to define those core capabilities. So if we've got an ability to have a user on another cloud, you know what the cloud is capable of, then I think it gets down to, it has to make economic sense. So if to do this without recognizing these providers need to make money and therefore they need to do billing, cross billing, you know, we, so there's an economic basis that we need to start worrying about. And those might be, might be already in place. You know, we have them for other mechanisms. We have them for the banking system. We have them for the airline system. We have them for a lot of other places where different companies work together. And maybe we just need to apply them and adapt them to here. But, so if it's users, capabilities, a way to make money or bill, bill for things, I think we could, we could start there. Okay, that's, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate you, your attendance. <laughs>